Warhammer 2 style of heroes existed all the way back in medieval Tutot War Kingdoms. They are connected to the Crusades expansion. Each faction has one, and it provides them with a special ability. Now I knew the game had interesting historical characters with great traits, and I knew they had special abilities, but I did not know exactly what they did on the battlefield. Here they are. Kingdom of Jerusalem, King Richard. Special ability is Heart of the Lion, and it immediately rallies all routing units. The Ayyubid Sultanate, Saladin. Righteousness of Faith, briefly sets all non-routing units, Mamal, to full. The Saljuks, Nur Adin Zangi, Light of the Faith, briefly increases attack speed and morale of troops. Byzantine Empire, Manuel Komnenos, Byzantine politics, causes infighting amongst an enemy unit, essentially removing them from play until order is restored or they are attacked. It can only be used once per battle. Antioch, Philip Augustus, Flower of Chivalry, briefly increases attack power and stamina of all troops. Overall, if I knew of these earlier, I would have been able to use them to greater effect. And these special abilities are very similar to Warhammer 2 or Warhammer 1 in a way. You know, not exactly the same, but they are on the same theme and have the same powers. Welcome to 7 things I wish I knew earlier about Medieval 2 Tot Wars Kingdoms expansion. This is just stuff I wish I knew earlier. If you know them all, good for you, and feel free to say so. But that is not the purpose of today's video. Number 2. This was never meant to be on the list. Thank you to MQI on Discord for pointing this one out. Cavalry in Kingdoms is slower than Cavalry in Vanilla, and overall less effective. Meaning that your entire army composition, which in Vanilla would have favoured Cavalry, may now lean slightly more towards Infantry, which is a feature that I like. Speaking of unit changes, fatigue is much more probable in Kingdoms than in Vanilla, so it's going to be much more of a problem. Be prepared for that. Number 3. Not something that will help your gameplay exactly, but it is interesting. Of course, you can make non-playable factions playable through easily modding the files. If you were to do that for Norway and the Mongols in the Teutonic campaign, here's some interesting features you may not know. The Norwegians cannot recruit units and are 100% reliant on their starting units, new generals and mercenaries. And the Mongols, they lose 2,500 gold per turn through the King's Purse. The King's Purse feature adds money for all factions, but takes away from the Mongols, which is a very interesting mechanic. As I said, it's not something I wish I knew earlier exactly, as it's not vital to your campaign, but still, it is an interesting thing some of you may want to know, and probably did not know before this. What the Britannia campaign did with forts makes them much better. Forts are not purchasable, and are instead preset onto the map in certain locations. If you have troops in forts, four of them do not pay upkeep. This allows for a load of interesting strategies. Fort hopping with expensive units to save on upkeep. It also makes small garrisons in forts worthwhile, as you're not paying any upkeep at all, so you might as well put something in them. And you can also use them as a storage site for knights and other expensive units, and only take them out and into the nearby city once an enemy force is nearby. So basically, use it however you want. Free money, free transport, or free defence. Use it however you want. I figured this out in my third let's play, as I had no reason to expect forts did this, so I did not look into it. It was a massive help to my future campaigns once I did figure this out. And you know, if you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in Medieval 2 Total to War and Kingdoms, you know, these points are not going to help you. These videos are more for uh, the newer players to the games, or those who don't have the thousands of hours. 
but even those who do have thousands of hours, uh, like myself, do still only just discover this stuff, uh, because there's no reason for, for these players to actually look into it. Number 5, over to the Americas. Native factions, such as the Apache and the Shishimek, can learn of foreign technologies by beating their opponents in battle, allowing them to eventually build similar units. This is a very interesting feature. Now, I never played as either of these factions, as I just saw them as far away and uninteresting and similar to the Aztecs and, you know, just copy and paste factions. But it turns out these factions have more depth than I first thought, and I wish I knew this earlier so I could have played and experienced them, rather than just assuming it was going to be a slow, repetitive campaign. Number 6. I saw this one online and it made me laugh. Of course, some units in the Teutonic campaign require the settlement to be of a certain religion for it to be able to train certain units, like must be 70% Catholic for this unit or 80% for this unit, stuff like that. That is a good feature. However, it means that you can also use your own priests to spend time converting enemy settlements towards uh, your religion and then they will never be able to recruit those units. So you can really annoy the AI with this. It's not the most viable strategy, just spend your money on armies and destroy them that way, but it sounds like a good laugh if you were to do it. And if you saw some worthwhile gain from it, then good for you. Although it could be very useful in hot seats. Hmm. Last but not least, many of you know this one as I made a video on it already, but it still deserves a spot in here. In the Teutonic campaign, there is a formable nation. Like something you would find out of EU4 or something like that. If you play as Denmark and hold some set regions, then kill the Norwegian faction leader, I think, you then are presented with the option to form the Kalmar Union. If you switch to the Kalmar Union, this changes your name, your flag, and adds some additional units to your roster. I made a whole video covering this before, so won't go too much into it. But yeah, I wish I knew this many years ago when I had the time to play Total War 4. Six hours a day, if I wanted to. I never picked Denmark, as I thought there would be a dull copy and paste from Medieval to Vanilla. So I never picked them, never looked into them, or anything. Imagine how mind blown my young mind would have been upon getting the option to have a formable nation. I would have been so excited over the idea. It would have been great. Now there is one overall message here about most of the points that I made. When I first dropped Kingdoms, I saw it as being Medieval 2 Total War, but with some different campaigns. I did not play it much because of that. Overall, I wish I knew much earlier how much extra content is here, and how little of a copy and paste it actually is. Many factions, and by many I mean more than half, actually have interesting features to them that makes them unique. And this makes it so much more interesting and replayable. And that is the purpose of today's video, to give credit to Kingdoms and to try and tempt some of you who may not have been interested before to take a deeper look into it and give it a go. I wish I had done many years ago. Anyway, that is all I have got. I've been Melko and I hope you enjoyed. Like if you did, subscribe for more, and share with anyone who you think may be interested. It really helps the channel grow, and makes these videos more worthwhile. Until the next one, goodbye.